aesthetic space, it's great to be in the cash pay business. You don't need to deal with Medicare. You don't need to even deal with commercial payers a lot of times. You deal with people who want to look beautiful and uh, are willing to pay for it. So it's a, it's a great place for you to be. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Technology of Beauty, where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and shakers of the beauty business. And today is no exception. Today, I have the opportunity to interview Tim Lugo from William Blair. Welcome, Tim. Grant, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for flying down from the Bay Area and uh, being our guest. Uh, it's an easy flight. Just took an hour, and uh, I always love to come down to Southern California. I'm, I was born down here, so I love to come back and visit. That, well, we're going to get to that. Okay. All but right. first, do you want to have any uh, disclosures or anything from William Blair? I do, yeah. We, we do have a compliance department, and they are very. They want me to tell everyone to look at williamblair.com for all relevant disclosures. I am a public marketing ec uh, equity analyst, so everyone does need to be aware of the disclosures involved with uh, you know, my opinions and thoughts around the industry. So everyone, we're going to find out what in heaven's name a, a private equity analyst. <laughs> I'm, I'm a public market public market equity analyst. equity analyst is. I can't even say it. I certainly don't know what it is. Okay, let's start with. You said you you grew up here. You were born in SoCal. Are you a native? Native. I was born actually in the valley uh -huh. at around one years of age. Uh, I went down to um, Orange County, uh, where I grew up uh, my whole life until. I was 18 where I moved up to uh, Berkeley to join UC Berkeley. Where'd you go to high school? Modern day. I went to Catella. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so very I, close by. Yeah. Very close by. I grew up in Anaheim. My Not parent. a rival, but no. close by. Yeah. yeah. Servite was your rival. Servite was our, uh, yeah, was our was our rival. And uh, not much of a rivalry, though. We did tend to beat them in most of the sports we uh, played them in. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so you grew up in, down there in Orange County, and then you went to Berkeley, to Cal Berkeley. Yeah, I went to Cal Berkeley. Uh, studied, started a poli sci major. Uh huh. Uh, about one semester into that, realized I didn't really like writing too much, and uh, transitioned, kind of searched around a bit. Uh, started studying genetics. Uh, ended with a molecular and cellular biology degree, emphasis in genetics, double major, economics. So I say genetics and economics, and um, yeah. So you have a science and business background. I've always kind of been marrying the two. In all honesty, I was never great at science. The laboratory work was kind of tedious for me. Um, I really love the industry though. I love kind of the 10,000 foot perspective. And I just started doing that really young, even you know my 20s. So. Okay, so after Berkeley, did you go right? Yeah, after Berkeley, I was planning to do my PhD. I always wanted to go Caltech down here to uh -huh. do my PhD. Um, one of my advisors at Berkeley also had a lot of uh, connections with Caltech. Uh, I decided to take a year off, though, and work in biotech. I joined a genomics startup during the kind of human genome uh, race, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I kind of never looked back. Uh, so I joined the startup, worked there for about three years. As a lot of startups do, it imploded. Uh, but everyone kind of dispersed throughout the biotech industry. Um, and then I got a call from one of my friends who was at the genomic startup saying she was at an equity research position at a small uh, kind of boutique investment bank focusing on biotech in San Francisco. She asked me to come and in, uh, interview for a position there. She thought I'd be good uh, joining the team. Uh, she left to go to Stanford to do her grad school. I stayed in finance and kind of never looked back. The you know, once you join finance, the economics of taking five years of your life and going back to grad school never really work out. So, uh -huh. uh, I've been in the industry for about 16 years now. And the whole time in the Bay Area? A whole time in the Bay Area outside of four years where I moved to Chicago. Uh, so I work at William Blair. William Blair is traditionally based in Chicago, although they have international offices throughout the globe. We have a big office in San Francisco. I worked there for about four years, and I'm a California native, and in general, just a bit soft when it comes to weather. So as soon as I, <laughs> I got a promotion, I had to move back to California. And so I moved back to San Francisco now about seven years ago. Okay. Yeah. And what do you actually do at William Blair? So I'm the head of biotech and pharma research. So we have a team of about 16 people now 
14 of them are PhDs, six of them are senior analysts, and we just cover the pharma and biotech sector. You know, there's probably 300 plus publicly traded pharma and biotech companies. We need to know about a lot of them. Uh -huh. So we cover them very broadly. We go to every medical meeting. I know this is an aesthetics fo focused podcast. So we do, you know, I cover the aesthetic space at William Blair among some other uh, verticals, but we have to cover all of medicine, essentially. Every sort of new technology coming down the pipeline in medicine, our team is out there at medical conferences, looking at, judging, writing about. Only publicly traded companies, or what about startups? We work with startups a lot. Uh, so our banking side, and I know you're gonna have Lindsey Carlson from our banking team later right. uh, today, they work with a lot of the startups as well. Um, on the research side, we have to know about kind of every interesting startup in the sector. Uh, so we do do a lot of um, work and talking to a lot of private companies. I probably talk to at least five private companies weekly. Um, I think our whole team talks to at least 300 per year. And uh, so we're always talking to, uh, to startup companies. And when you say talking to them, could you um elaborate on that just what does that look like are you looking at their financials are you just going to lunch what are you talking about they usually it's usually an introduction they tell us what they're doing we look at their technology we look at kind of what is their business all about um we then decide uh, how are we going to engage with this company uh, do they want to be a public company eventually do they want to be acquired by a public company eventually or just a larger company eventually um, so we can play a little bit of a role in most of those uh, in most of those things which they want to accomplish. Uh, do they need to fundraise? Do they need to raise a Series B? Do they need to do a crossover round before they go public? Um, eventually, companies either want to become massive companies that are usually public companies, or they want to be acquired by a public company. So you know, eventually we will see them uh, coming down the uh, pipeline. And then do you facilitate that? Be that either going public or being acquired? Exactly. Is that so part of your role? William Blair in general will facilitate all of that. Uh, we usually talk to companies as their later stage private, uh, and then with the anticipation of becoming a public company or if they're going to be acquired by a public company. So we kind of come in usually Series C or so, um, usually before maybe even the crossover round as well before going public. Uh, but I also talk to a lot of companies doing their seed rounds. So it's really a range, you know, it's a, I speak to them mostly throughout their whole, t their kind of whole uh, life cycle. And do you take an ownership position, you meaning William Blair? Do you actually own part of these companies? Is this is in these routes that you're talking about? Uh, C round, for yep. instance, are going public. There's a lot of ways that we structure those type of uh, those type of deals when we do engage with them on the private side. Sometimes we will, sometimes we won't. It's really everything's kind of unique to what that company needs at that time. But William Blair will, you know, we have put our money into private uh, rounds in the past. I've put my own personal money into private rounds in the past, mm -hmm. um, and then we have a whole public side where once these companies become public you know we have about 100 billion or so in assets sometimes a little bit more sometimes a little less uh where we are always in the public markets investing in companies and do you have a trading desk yep then? yep we have a trading desk fully functional across the uh, globe um and we're getting more into trading uh private securities as well um that's kind of a push that we're thinking about over the uh, next couple of years. So on the public side, we facilitate all of that trading between kind of large institutional funds like Fidelity, Capital Research, those type of places, taking large positions in companies. Uh, but we also go all the way down to smaller companies as well. Okay. So let's go to aesthetics yeah. in particular. Could you walk us through some of the deals you've been a part of uh, historically, if you can? I mean, can you talk about some of the companies you've worked yeah, with? Yeah, definitely. And then I, maybe who you're working with now, if, if you can reveal that. Sure. There, it is kind of always touchy upon, you know, the actual names of the companies that we're always working with at a certain time and place. Uh, but in general, my coverage right now is very broad through the SX market where I look at everything that goes through FDA. 
uh, everything that's uh, approved as a drug. Um, I have a colleague that works on everything that's approved as a device. Um, I know, uh, yeah, I know that's a lot of the companies that come in and speak to you. Uh-huh. Uh, I am, right now I'm a covering analyst on Revance. Uh, I have covered Allergan in the past. I covered them during the Pyatt regime. I covered them uh, when Brunt uh, <laughs> took over. I've kind of seen that, uh, and now as it's uh, part of AbbVie. Um, so I've seen them. Are you covering AbbVie also? I'm then, not now? covering AbbVie as of now. I do know the company pretty well, uh, I would say. And, um, you know, it's an interesting time for that company, for sure. They're about to, you know, at, we're, in the, we're in an aesthetics podcast. Right. Uh, the whole Allegan portion of Abby is about five billion in revenue. Mm-hmm. Uh, Humira, one of their larger products, is about to lose patent coverage, and there's going to be kind of a biosimilar competition to that product over the next five years. That's a twenty billion dollar drug for them. Uh, so that's a company that's in this mode of transition. They have a great pipeline. They have some great kind of earlier stage assets, growing into becoming blockbusters or already blockbusters, but growing into becoming mega blockbusters. It's an interesting company, though, and it's an interesting time for that, uh, for that, how they're going to transition over the next five years. No doubt. And I think with that Allergan acquisition, very smart because people want to be in the cash pay business over the next five years. You know, there's a lot of talk, um, and they're not just talk, now there's legislation around pricing controls in kind of the uh, branded uh, pharmaceutical and biotech space. Uh, that is only going to become more of a topic in, across medicine, mm-hmm. uh, where large blockbusters are going to be, um, you know, Medicare is going to push back on, you know, Humira being a $20 billion drug going forward. Uh, they need to s- save costs. And so pushing down on that pharma bill uh, for Medicare is going to be a focus over the next 10 years. Aesthetic space. It's great to be in the cash pay business. You don't need to deal with the Medicare. You don't need to even deal with commercial payers a lot of times. You deal with people who want to look beautiful and uh, are willing to pay for it. So it's a, it's a great place for you to be. Well, we certainly love it. Yeah, exactly. As you're looking into the markets, uh, what are the areas? So you, you say you're not doing device as much. You mainly do the pharma side of aesthetics. Yeah, I do pharma and biotech. I have a, I have a colleague called Margaret Kayser. She's very smart on the uh, on the device space. Okay, companies you may have worked with besides you mentioned Abby and Allergan and so forth. You uh, did Revance. you have anything to do yep. Revance, yep. right? Revance. Uh, were you working with Hydrofacial in that acquisition at all? So Margaret uh, covers the beauty company um, and the Hydrofacial product, and um, I do think that there is uh, some discussions between our firm and uh, and the hydrofacial people. Again, I'm not trying to work you for inside information. That's just fine. Because <laughs> I've seen you at the at the uh, programs at the shows, and yep. uh, I didn't know that actually you were researching the companies. Always, you know, you were always look and you know AIS, all these yeah. uh, places. They you that's where you go to see the interesting young companies coming into um, you know coming into the space. And so we all have to attend. You know, it's probably odd for a physician to see somebody from Wall Street attending a medical meeting, but we all do it. Well, I've gotten used to it at AIS because okay. we have so many business people there and yeah. we're kind of catering towards the business community. We think about it. That's Aesthetic Innovation Summit every year right before the Aesthetic Society meeting. This year it'll be in April in Miami. So I'm, I'm sure going. I'll see you there. Yeah, yeah. I'm going. We, uh, we're always open to hearing about new companies that we might want to give some, uh, some time to and mm-hmm. highlight them and give them some uh, podium time. So if you have some suggestions, definitely uh, have some suggestions. we're always open yeah. to that. Definitely. Uh, that's a fun meeting. Yeah. And there's a lot of interaction. This year, we heard about a company that where you wear... You, you wear something that has drugs coming out of the, what you're wearing. What was that all about? Do you remember that? I, I heard that company on your, a, on your AIS podcast, <laughs> yeah. and I was intrigued. I was <laughs> doing my homework before showing up for this podcast, <laughs> listening to some of the old episodes that I hadn't heard before, uh, and that seemed fascinating. You know, I take B vitamins. I take, you know, my, kind of my daily men's formula, 
And uh, I'm just wondering, okay, can I just wear socks instead of taking those uh, taking those vitamins every morning? It was crazy. And pain relief, too. You wear the socks and then somehow your pain goes away in your in your foot or ankle. Very interesting. Capsaicin, you know, it's it's spicy. So I wonder if there is any sort of uh, topical. uh, I'm not uh, I'd have to see. I'd have to see wearing socks with capsaicin on. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to try that out myself. I'm very interested in it, researching it. I have no, uh, I have no equity position in it at all. I have so I have no vested interest. But I thought it was very fascinating that I could Completely. wear a garment that would somehow give me medication. Crazy. Completely. Yeah. Speaking of that, have you heard about this company that has a topical, like a patch, uh, to stop sweating? I have. I have. I know uh, Nikki Hunt is uh, kind of. Um, you know, working uh, or I guess leading that company, and uh, I've known her for some time. I am, I've always been impressed by her, and I it seems that they have great data. Uh, I haven't seen it presented um, at the medical meetings yet, but I've spoken to her about it. it. Sounds like the data looks incredible. So that's a startup, right? Very intriguing. Would that be something you'd be interested in learning more about? So I've been talking to Nikki for a couple of years now. I knew her a couple other of her previous companies. And uh, she's just a great person. So I always catch up with her at least once a year or so. And uh, I couldn't be happy for, for her to uh, see the success that she's going to have. Yeah, I feel the same way about her and also about her company. And uh, uh, we're going to have her on the show here in the future. And we're looking forward to interviewing her and learning about this topical relief of sweating. Uh, I'm definitely going to listen to that one. Yeah, same and, here. If we could throw yeah. away antiperspirants and exactly. deodorants. And, and the dosing is incredibly easy, right? Very practice friendly. You know, if they're in a chair, why not, you know, slap this patch on? Yeah. Them? I mean, yeah. can you imagine if you're getting a hydrofacial or even getting your, you know, nails done or whatever? It's just a few minutes of, uh, under your arms. It uses uh, uh, heat to yep. get rid of it. For only three minutes aside. It's crazy. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. It seems like the perfect product for a med spa environment. Mm-hmm. And as you know, med spa's kind of growth has been so fast over the past few years. Um, you know, that's uh, who doesn't have kind of this extra three to six minutes of chair time that they could uh, you know leverage for an additional product. Or you could do it while you're doing something. Exactly. I mean, so it, yeah. it actually conceivably could be no added time if you mm-hmm. think about it. Yeah. Um, and you know, a hundred years ago, women weren't getting hair and nails done every uh, couple of weeks. And now, who wouldn't get their hair and nails done? What woman doesn't get her nails done or get her hair done and and her colored or whatnot? Now, I'm thinking the sweat thing could be the next hair and nails thing, Completely. where people yeah. just incorporate it into their beauty regimen yep. uh, and throw away the antiperspirants. And nobody likes excessive sweat. Right. I mean, it's it's gross. You know, you get the rings and all that stuff. No one. Yeah, no one garments are ruined. When I exactly. interview women about this, about how many blouses they throw away or take to the dry cleaners. And then I found in part of my interviews that some women actually pick garments around the fact that they don't want to pit out. Mm-hmm. Like, so they won't buy this blouse because evidently it mm-hmm. tends to show more mm-hmm. or it's, it clings to their underarm or something. And I don't think many guys are too worried about that. Yeah. I certainly didn't. I've never thought about that. Let's put it that way. And maybe you do. Yeah. No. <laughs> I, know, I know there's some prescription products which have had kind of mixed success to mm-hmm. date. You know, there's some new ones coming that apparently are much more effective. So we'll see. But I think, yeah, Nikki's company seems extremely interesting. That'll be interesting yeah. to talk to her. In terms of other companies that you're looking at, can you tell us uh, any other exciting companies? I mean, I sure, I, I can definitely talk about, you know, general uh, companies. Uh, I think, you know, across medicine, there's going to be, uh, you know, we just see gene therapy being much more of an impact everywhere. Uh, I think that's eventually coming to the aesthetic space. Uh, I know that there's a company looking at a rare disease right now, filed with the FDA, um, dystrophic EB, um, where, you know, if that gets approved next year, uh, I know they also have an aesthetics product kind of in the skunk works, and they've, you know, publicly discussed this. I think that's incredibly interesting. Um, that will, you know, we'll see how it kind of works its way through regulatory and all of that. And I know in the aesthetic space, people want high impact products. You know, mm-hmm. it's not just a thirty percent, you know, kind of efficacy. People want, you know, 60, 70, 80, 100 percent efficacy. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, that'll be interesting, though. I mean, why not kind of use your own production of natural collagen? Why not replace that instead of, um, you know, instead of what we've been doing in the past? And then, you know, there's been a lot of new formulations coming to the market for in the filler space, and those are all great products. I think technology is just going to keep making that more, uh, kind of keep making those outcomes better and better, especially over the next five years. It might not be 2023, it might not be 2024, but over the next five years, I think gene therapy is probably coming to the aesthetic space. Okay, well that's very exciting. Yeah. How do? What about exosomes? That was a big buzzword in AIS and everywhere. It seemed everybody's talking talking about exosomes. Exactly. Are you in that space also? I I, I kind of loosely follow it a little bit. Uh, I'm very intrigued with exosomes as well, and we will see kind of what's the regulatory path for these products. I think that's what needs to be spelled out with a lot of these next generation kind of technologies is, is the FDA going to give them kind of a, a simple path to market? Will they be able to work with these innovators and uh, enable kind of these new technologies come to the market? Because the FDA can be kind of a stickler, especially when it comes <laughs> to the aesthetic space. So, no kidding. Um, yeah. So, uh, I I understand they regulate twenty percent of our economy, so that's a lot of you know that's a lot of work. Uh, but yeah, they could be a little bit difficult sometimes. So yeah, we, talk to Revance about that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's coming though. Revance's time is well. Is that's approaching perfect because I want to ask you about that. What do you think about duration as it were as it relates to neuromodulators specifically? Specifically, for those of you, neuromodulator, the classic one obviously is Botox. Yep. And there are a number of Botoxes, if you will. There's yep. only one actual Botox. And in general, they last three to four months uh, tops. And then the person comes in for another injection. So right now, everything's an injection for those of you uh, that aren't familiar with that. Now, there is a company. There's actually more than one company, but yeah. and we're one talking one about company, duration yeah. now. Yep. Uh, and... Uh, what are your thoughts about duration? How might that affect the market, in your opinion, uh, one way or the other? I think it's going to impact the market heavily. It's, I mean, just think of all the products we've seen come to the market, Zium and Disport, Javeau. They, they don't really change duration at all. No, they don't. And, they're and they don't claim to. And they don't claim to, exactly. They don't have that on the label. Revance looks to be the first product that can really have that claim on duration at six months. It's going to be new. I've heard people already coming into derm offices requesting it, saying, oh, I want that long-acting Botox. Um, maybe you've even had some of these patients coming into your practice. We have. Exactly. Uh, we I, absolutely have. Because their phase three trial is very large, largest study ran in the space. Um, you know, word is definitely out on this product. And I think it's going to have a major impact on the product. Uh, on aesthetic space, and I know you know we don't talk about uh, kind of the therapeutic side as much, but therapeutic side is now a majority of Botox. Here. Yes, so and a lot of people don't realize that. Exactly, they think Botox wrinkles, but to your point, to yeah. make to make that clear, Botox therapeutic, that is to say, not the beauty Botox, is a bigger market than Botox, if you will, cosmetic. I know it's incredible. And I know you know that, but it, it is not a well-known uh, fact. And when you think of duration. If you were getting it for your migraines or for yeah. your sweaty arms or yeah. for your torticollis or any of your, your yeah, all the different spasti- things. Upper limb spasticity. That's right. If it could last, let's say, hypothetically six months instead of three months, exactly. wouldn't you think that would affect um, I think utilization? And, and I would think yeah. since third-party carriers are covering it, mm-hmm. I would just think they would like that better or mm-hmm. Medicare would like it better going to the doctor twice a year versus four times a year. Exactly. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and at the end of the day, you're going to have innovation coming to this sector. This is a new product. It's changing how physicians are going to be treating patients. And we see the competitors as well. You know, we see Galderma coming with their six-month product. I know Fleming was on. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, he probably has a little bit to work out with Ibsen on how that's going to be eventually launched and marketed. Uh, but we see other people coming with six-month products. You know, Allergan worked on one as well. Mm-hmm. And But Revance is here. Their Perdufa date's coming up in September, and it's going to be on the market, I think, in Q4. You know, <laughs> not going to work. And uh, I think it's going to start changing the market starting in 2023. I'm, a, I'm, extremely, uh, I'm extremely optimistic about that product. Well, I would agree entirely with you. So yeah. we'll I mean, we see. We see what Avalis has done with, you know, a similar product to Botox, we'll just say. I don't know. It's not differentiated on duration. 
Um, you know, they have great marketing. They have a new brand. They have a great brand. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's been an extremely successful launch. So just imagine if there's something that's going to be truly differentiated on the product label as well, something new that, you know, you can go to a physician with. David Modizetti was on the show also. I, I, and he's I heard the episode. very creative. Yeah. Exactly. And he knows the space cold, having come from Allegan and working with David Pyatt and exactly. all the rest. Yep. Yeah, he's done an extraordinarily great job. Uh, now, there's another product that allegedly is going to come out and try to compete on price and try to crush the price from the Hugo people. Uh, any thoughts about that? Uh, I don't want to have see a race to the bottom like in Korea. Exactly. Um, Nobody. No one, when you're injecting things into your face, do you really want the cheapest product? <laughs> when, you're, when you're injecting the most toxins, exactly the most potent. I want the cheapest poison. No, the person, exactly. <laughs> do you really want to be, you know, saving a couple hundred bucks there? Uh, I'd probably cancel my Netflix subscription first. You know, I'd probably save money in some other ways. So that's just me. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, maybe your patients. I assume they probably feel the same. That's kind of why I like Revance focusing on, you know, kind of a premier uh, practices, kind of, you know, making it uh, very much a, you know, focusing on kind of the upper end of the uh, of the market. I personally don't think we should be racing to the bottom when it comes to neurotoxins. I don't know. That's just yeah. me. Yeah. I agree totally. <laughs> but, you know, there's that rumor out there that they're going to be crushing the price and racing to the bottom. I think it's really uh yeah. Ill advised. You already see Groupons yes. for, you know, a hundred dollar <laughs> injections. So what's the difference? You mm -hmm. know, I'm not sure, you know, going a hundred to twenty dollars, at the end of the day it's still really cheap. Um, it's targeting a certain part of the market and as we probably don't talk enough about, the market's growing. It keeps growing. You know, mid teens growth, we see all the players have had extremely strong growth this year. Uh, we see some of them up 50%, all the newer products launched. You know, even the legacy products are up mid-teens, 20%, 25%. So the market keeps getting larger. You know, the patient population keeps getting younger. It's probably a great market for kind of the very cheap versions or if you're younger, you don't have as much money. You know, maybe you're a little more risk uh, tolerant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, me personally, I would like the proven kind of strong products with, you know, kind of great product labels, you know, great clinical research behind them. So so you talk about the growth in this industry, and uh, I couldn't agree with you more. The, the growth has been unbelievable, and we didn't know what was going to happen after COVID and, yeah. and the sustainability. The growth just keeps going, as you mentioned, double yeah. digit in the teens. Exactly. So when you look in your crystal ball and you look forward, three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, when you come back on this show three, five years from now, what are we gonna be talking about? What do you see in the future? I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna look, you know, five years from now and just see, the, just see that growth still going. You know, mid-teens growth probably, we're, we might have a blip or two around this current recession, on this current economic pullback. Historically though, that didn't really occur in 2008, 2009 significantly it was very minor mm -hmm. so i think we might have a little bit of a blip and then it just keeps growing new technologies new products coming onto the market i talked about gene therapy we you know there are some other areas ai is going to eventually come into the world as well so five years from now it's going to just be only better products and probably better outcomes for uh for our patients that's fantastic well tim it's been an absolute delight having you on the program i've learned a ton and uh, I know our guests, or excuse me, our viewers have learned a ton also. And uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, watching this episode and listening to it. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us, Tim? I just want to thank you for having me. This has uh, been really fun. And as a listener of the podcast, it's going to be fun to listen to this while I'm uh, working out. <laughs> well, good. And we'll have to have you back on. And let's talk about AIS in Miami for sure. Definitely. And get some of those uh, some of those companies on the AIS podium. Definitely, I love attending AIS. I always learn so much when I go there. And Miami, you, you know, that's going to be a fun time. Exactly. Okay. Well, safe travels back to the Bay Area. See you soon. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Take care. Me.